So that's what I'm saying. I, the text is like an object. It's going to change perspective based on where you're standing. I don't know. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. Hmm. It was a day. Please tell me you're seeing this too. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. All right, so we're just going to start off a little bit different. You watched one of my favorite movies and you did not love it this year. What movie was that? Arctic. Oh, man, we are just diving right in, aren't so, we? So just a, a quick, oh, man. Just, a, just a sideways curtsy. Yeah. What, uh, did you give it a heart? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Definitely a three and a heart, yeah. Okay, I just... I'm having a hard time seeing how that's only one star better than Ma, to be honest with you. Ah, uh, yeah. It was a perfect five for you, right? Perfect five. Yeah, yeah. Um, incredibly atmospheric. I was with Mads Mikkelsen the whole way. I, I, mm. His bones was a character. Like, his skin was a character. Mm. His face was a character. The weathering, the sun burning, um, the ice, the gliss. Like, it just... Yeah, it, it was an atmospheric piece. And I, I do wonder mm. if that's one of those things where being in the Arctic in a theater changes mm. it in a way that the home theater experience doesn't. Yeah, it was definitely, uh, it was an at-home watch. It was an impulsive watch where I'm like, I, I still got time for a movie. I'm going to get one in. Yeah, um, and I'd, you know, I'd, I'd been it, bullying you about it. For it didn't have the benefit of, you know, the little lead up where I had kind of been planning it. It was a quick watch, or not a quick watch, but an impulsive one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I kept kind of waiting to be a bit more, like, just surprised by the journey. Um, I mean, I guess I, I did very much appreciate, I think it's Joe Pena is the director. Mm-hmm. Um, Directorial debut. Yeah, that he's doing much of the storytelling visually, right? Like, there's not a lot of dialogue. I think most of what we learned about this guy who's stranded alone. Well, there's um, almost we learned, no dialogue. Yeah, very little. He's talking to the another character a little bit, um, and a, a little bit to himself, maybe, if I remember correctly. But yeah, you're right. A it's, little it's bit hardly, of yelling as he hardly... tries to unstick himself from some situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I can't say that there were just that many shots that are really going to be seared in my memory. Um, I... Um, and that's maybe like, where we I, I I get that. There is not that that master cinema Paul Thomas Anderson look of yeah. this thing. Yeah. What it is though is an atmospheric piece of despair more so. And I to me some of those tundra shots like I still think about, but they're not artistic mm-hmm. in the way that I think you might be um commenting on. Yeah, a little bit. And I mean maybe it's not fair to, you know, ask it to be more art house and it's trying to be i don't mean to be yeah like to say why that, doesn't but... he have an extra five hundred thousand dollars to shoot on film stock and on right. a more expensive camera in the middle grainier. of the arctic yeah <laughs> <laughs> a little more off-center framing that kind of thing yeah, yeah um yeah i suppose i found it mostly um trying to be this sort of um display of human determination and um didn't, it just didn't only did so it. much for me mm-hmm. um you know it's this thing that i kind of felt asking me to say wow he refuses to give up on this woman who um he he could have um left and was doing really just fine until she came along and his would-be rescuer ends up being the one who now is in more need of rescue than him. Um, and it's sort of this, the act of selflessness that this movie is about, that he's, um, uh, I I think it's even a bigger story about like humans or like, he's trying to, you know, make that claim of like the humans are by nature, um, good to each other in these harsh situations. Right. Right. That's, Um, that's why we, I think gravitate towards stories of grace in war. Um, that's, yeah. uh, what was that Mel Gibson film that he did? Uh, H- Hacksaw Ridge. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, like we, we enjoy these stories more about grace than these de- determinum deterministic situations that are, that are very difficult than, right. Right. you know, we would expect. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. And w- what did you think about the the kind of haunting of the polar bear? Uh, the polar bear work didn't, against it. Um, I uh, not a particularly strong reaction either. Oh, okay. way, to be honest, it gave me dread like throughout the film because really you're like just you just his, you his never presence. Well, or... you never know in that white landscape when the polar bear is just gonna emerge from it as a silhouette. Yep. You, you know, like you yep. never. So every time there's white, that could be the polar bear there. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, there was definitely a palpable sense of dread the whole film for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean. Didn't love it. Didn't hate it. Is it your favorite directorial debut this year that you've seen? Uh, I think I would still go with An Elephant Sitting Still as my oh, favorite right. debut. That is a debut. Um, Shit, I gotta put that on my list. Yeah, yeah, totally. Crap. Um, what are your other few? Um, what is it? Booksmart. Oh yeah, um, I forgot about Booksmart. Yeah. That Lily James Tessa Thompson film, uh, Little Woods, or oh, something yeah. like that. Yeah, and. Uh, Dark Phoenix. That was a debut. Mm-hmm. I did not know that, so that is not at the top of your list. I that is it. at the bottom. That would make sense. Yeah. Very nice. All right. Let's do some first impressions. All right. We've got Dr. Sleep or Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. What do you want to do first? Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Do you want to see Haunted House? Some kids went missing, so they boarded it up. Okay, we saw it. We go now. Who ordered the chicken? What's that? It's a book of scary stories. Scariest stories to tell in the dark. What do we think, Michael? I'm mildly intrigued. I saw at the end it's coming out in August. I think I would rather watch this like in October around Halloween. It's got a spooky vibe to it. I think I would maybe prefer a fall release to accompany this kind of fare, but... Um, That's a thought I think about every time I see a horror film trailer. Really? I mean, something... Um, like the Annabelle film, or... Yeah. Like, even when I saw Crawl, it's just like, It, too. Like, yeah. why Child's Play? Why are none of these movies coming out around Halloween? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a fair point, um... Uh, you know, I'm kind of a sucker for practical effects. I kind of like the look of most of these monsters. What about you? Yeah, very intrigued. Um, yeah. Um, I think the one movie of his I've seen was The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Did you see that yeah, one? Yes, so he did The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Right, right, right. Yeah. Love that um, movie. Love that movie. Yeah, I don't think I gave it a great review. I sort of, like, am remembering it more fondly than I think I might have rated it. That was it. Uh, Emil Hirsch um, and Brian Cox. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I really, really a, enjoy that film. Yeah. Um, or in like a morgue, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it, I probably watched it at like in broad daylight on a Saturday afternoon and didn't get the full effect from it, but I'm remembering it finally. Like, I don't That's fine. Um, th- th- like, that's because I think I did the same thing, but like, that didn't oh, take not a problem. Take that. I like to watch horror during the day because I'm a giant pussy. There you go. But, um, yeah, like the just the filmmaking, the suspense, the terror, the building up of characters, and the suspension of disbelief was all really effective in that one. Um, yeah. If I remember right, a certain love interest becomes like one of the villains. I think um, that's right. Yeah, and, and just the the way that it was played was just very, very efficient and effective to me. Yeah, storytelling wise. Yeah, yeah, I, very I, smooth. I just seem to think I seem to remember being sharper than I think I might have rated it. So it's just actually working as I think. Um, a way of exciting me for what he's got. So, yeah. um, we'll see. Indeed. On to Dr. Sleep. You're magic. Like me. I need you to listen to me. The world's a hungry place. A dark place. Hi there. I only met two or three people like us. They died. When I was a kid, I bumped into these things. I don't know about magic. I... I always called it The Shining. All right. We just watched the trailer for Dr. Sleep. We did. Thoughts, questions, concerns, comments. I don't think that it lines up with the book, but 
with Stephen King, it does all honestly tend to bleed for me. Like it just, it's all blended together. You read the book, Dr. Sleep? Yeah, I'm just now remembering that I'd read the book. Um, Looked familiar? Or like seemed familiar? Ago. Yeah, well, the, the Rebecca Ferguson character, if I remember correctly, is like, um, she's part of like this vampire troupe. Mm. Um, and they like, they want to get this kid's, the new psychic um, blood because it will like keep them young for a very, very long time and is very valuable to vampires um, in their aging process as they decay as a species on the planet. And I just, I don't remember all the kind of asides that I'm seeing mm. in this film, but um, it looks, it looks intriguing. It doesn't look bad. And yeah. I, I like the uh, actors they lined up and I, I like the general look of it. Doesn't look like it's going to be anything crazy. Just a reliable commercial piece that might be safe. Yeah. 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 My fear with something like this is that the, the mystery of an original can sometimes be it uh, they can try to explain it away, and I, I never really care for that. I hope that isn't the route this goes in. Um, explain what away? Uh, just you know, some of the the, the mystery of uh, the original Shining. Um, you know, I wouldn't want them to the book or the film. The film. I have not okay. read either the because the book, book ruins the film book. itself. You know, like it just does. Like, like it's um, it explains things, and, and you might say it mm-hmm. explains things away because. That's yeah, just how King yeah. is. He has his own universe. Everything's tied together. Everything does have a legitimate explanation. So. Yeah. I've never been a huge Stephen King fan. So if this, it does seem like this is leaning more towards in, leaning more his direction than yeah, I believe it's as produced an extension by him. of the so. movie. Um, so I, I feel like it's going to be sort of like a course correction from something that I don't think really needs to, needs correcting. Yeah. Um, but I don't think the filmmaking looks um, poor by any means. I think it looks very nicely put together. So um, it's just going to kind of depend on the direction they take some of that original material. I, I think we might be at the point where The Shining has to... We have to admit The Shining is going to have an influence on Stephen... Or like on Stephen's um, working filmography and his books. Like the film The Shining just is going to have that effect. And that it probably should be considered a standalone film. And that it might also be useful as a, a keystone for navigating the King universe moving forward. And I think that he's written so many stories that we do have to at least see if those stories translate good to cinema now. I know that in the 90s we saw that when King was heavily involved, it did not translate well. There yeah. were very bad B-movies that you know ended up terribly. But yeah. in this modern day of... It going the way that it is, may, where there's horror movies all year round and we don't understand why they're not in October, it might be good for him to take back one of his strongest main characters, who is a psychic boy that had a murderous father and, you know, had that experience in the Overlook Hotel and navigate through some of King's stories that way, because we saw the Dark Tower didn't exactly pan out. Yeah, yeah, and I'm more interested in where a director can take the material than where the material is coming from. So, you know, with, um, any given director, you know, I'll still be open to, um, what they want to do with it. So got to give it a shot. Yep. And on that note, let's go over to the dead. Don't die. In this peaceful town, on these quiet streets, something terrifying Something horrifying is coming. Excuse me, we're closed. Get away from me! What the hell was it? A wild animal? This is really awful. Maybe the worst thing I've ever seen. What was it, wild animals? So what are you thinking? I'm thinking zombies. What? You know, the undead. Ghouls. This was pretty high on my list of most anticipated films of the year. I don't think I actually called it out when we made our list. You did. But it was high up there. Maybe, I don't know if I actually knew of it at the time. That's maybe why it wasn't on there. Um, what about you? Were you um, I was very excited? eager, as you yeah. know. Only Lovers Left Alive is one of mm. my favorite films from this decade. Um, I responded very strongly to Patterson. 
Mm. I had extremely high hopes for this film, but not top 10 or, um, you know, the short list outside my top 10 hopes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just because it, it is a zombie movie, you know, like as much as I love the original Zombieland, I'm not going to put the Zombieland on my short list. Ah, um, yeah, yeah. So it, it kind of fell into that groove. And I think that I called it right personally. How do you feel about um, The Dead Don't Die now that you've seen it? I'm actually pretty positive on the film. I mean, there there are things here I, I don't care for, but overall, I'm positive. Sounds like you are not. It was... N- I think that I wanted to be entertained in a way that he didn't provide. Mm-hmm. I wanted more of a straightforward narrative that had less asides looking directly into the camera talking about Jim, the director. Mm. Um, I wanted less Adam Driver holding out a Star Destroyer on his keychain. Mm. Um, yeah, it's um, it, it's an interesting film on retrospect that I think is is actually going to age very well. I completely but, agree. But watching it in the cinema, um, I I was kind of beleaguered by it. And that mm. might just be ex- external life stuff. And then me showing up to the theater expecting like a good time and not getting mm. a good time. But like mm. there are moments with Caleb Landry Jones that I absolutely loved. Oh yeah, um, he's good. But I think at the seams, I just kept feeling the budgetary constraints. Like seeing mm. Steve Buscemi in one shot with the group and then never again in a shot with the group until the end like Uh, you can tell uh, the way that this was shot on a very small budget like it just i i could feel the filmmaking budget constraints at work the whole time yeah i could definitely um see that like because it is sort of like tricking in on these characters at different points in time you could definitely see how they all just kind of had their different couple weeks of shooting yeah um but I mean, I don't Four know. Days. I think that um, <laughs> I, I, that, that didn't cross my mind in, in the moment. It definitely didn't detract from it. Um, I mostly just kind of really enjoyed the relaxed, laid back rhythm of it. Like that's kind of what I come to uh, a Jarmish movie for. Um, is for that um, sort of um, leisurely paced kind of feel. Um, I think. Uh, Adam Driver and Bill Murray are super funny. I feel like they're they're timing together and they're just kind of ease with each other. It was just was just great. Like I had no problem uh, just patrolling uh, this town with them. Um, I think the repetition is actually just super nice. Like I think repetition's kind of like a poetic device. He's always kind of using um, that's that's just I wouldn't pleasant disagree. here. I um, I might disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> about just its effectiveness or no yeah. it being pleasant uh, i don't know yeah. that i'd agree with that but i i think it is poetic and i think it might be effective i yeah. just didn't find it pleasant yeah yeah um you know it's uh it's kind of hit and miss because it is a little bit um you know it's an ensemble piece some people kind of work better for you than others i don't really care for tilda swinton here i am super hot and cold on her lately um last week she was in my favorite movie of the year. I thought she was great here. I could have just cut her out entirely, and I think I would have been fine. Adam Driver, Bill Murray, Chloe... Um, Seven years? Savini. I always forget how to pronounce it. Um, I've got... I think they were great together. I used to call it Savini, and then you got me pronouncing it Seven years. <laughs> I and think now, we've switched. Now we've switched. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're covering our bases. <laughs> um, Caleb Landry Drones and... Caleb Landry Jones and... Uh, Danny Glover, Danny Glover, totally fine. Um, the uh, juvenile detention center patrolled by these like buff, bald white guys. Just funny quirk. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I just kind of appreciate the, um, the easiness of it. It's just very chill. Laid I, back I think what I didn't viewing. realize while I was watching it was it was criticism without commentary. Mm. and I thought that it was criticism with commentary, and then once you see the mm. end, you you kind of realize that the joke was that, Jar- that Jarmusch got you to think that he had, had a side mm. that he was on, you know, by depicting mm. certain people certain ways. Like, it seems like... And I think that he might, you know, have a side that's coming out, but I think in by the end of the film, we see that, that everyone is culpable. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, in, in a way that kind of uh, lessens his political stance that it seems like he's taking that my theater boot audibly groaned at. Um, and you know, yeah, did yeah. you have walkouts? I did not, but I definitely had groans. Okay, I, but I, I had, had a, plenty of laughs. Too. I had like a score of walkouts. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, know, I've, I think I've read that, but my, my mine was kind of divided. Like there were groans, and the old lady was not happy anytime somebody was getting eaten. Um, other people mm. were laughing at every uh, repeated line or every time yes. the song came on. So it was really kind of a mix. Um, I was definitely one of the people um, amused throughout. Um, I think I did not particularly care for the um, last scene in that the movie is kind of given over to Hermit Bob for his final sort of monologue Mm -hmm. about, um, you know, these about American materialism and these zombies um, wanting to consume as much as ever. Um, I mean, I do. Well, that's also right. I think there's a visual motif that we see with Hermit Bob. Where he's using his binoculars, so he's using a binary focal system to view the world. Then he's making mm. a claim about it, mm. and it's like, okay, American materialism, really? In the industrial age of man, you're going to say that it's American materialism? It's materialism, you know? It's it's the worldwide, and so I think that he's showing that like even our harshest critics are also have a skewed perspective, and I think that there's like mm. this commentary that kind of gets meta at each level of criticism from all the characters where like he's not only using the character's criticism he's also using what happens to that character and how they behave as a criticism of that character itself so even though steve buscemi is like a terrible trump guy he has some endearing qualities even though um bill murray's a good guy or um adam driver's a good guy who drives the smart car and stuff, they're still foolish, you know, or like, yeah, like the, yeah. there's, there's an outcome to each character that is also a further criticism of the character, regardless of the fact that we interpreted them positively. If that makes sense. Like, I feel like there's two levels of criticism happening and that's what I realized after the film. Yeah. I don't know that I even like that. It even struck me as like that complicated of a critique. Like I mostly just felt it being uh, a reflection of the here and now and that i mean i don't know that any of these characters were really um well defined enough for this to amount to a um critique or analysis of different kinds of american people because i think it's more interested in like rhythm and um mood and, and comedy, I think, than some of those things. I mean, I, I would almost, I'm almost, like, weary of um, calling this a um, a takedown of, like, Trump's America, because I no, think I'm, it's just... No, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. I wasn't trying to put words in your okay. mouth, but I think... No, I think I it's, I think it's that, a good poem. I, mm-hmm. I think it's one of those good poems that, like, you read it and you don't get it. You maybe don't like it. And then on further reflection, you're seeing between the lines, like you're seeing ha- how the flow has this certain effect um, and into that there, there's a deeper meaning to the words than just what the words say mm. is maybe the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of struck by how, you know, he's not going out of his way to... Um, uh, define each of these characters in, in a ton of depth but we're, we're clearly working with types in a way um you know you, your hipsters from Cleveland. yeah yeah um, are you sure they're not pittsburgh well they have ohio oh, plates. you're right <laughs> jumping to conclusions um but uh you know that the fact that the song keeps coming up the dead don't die song is is played by a handful of them well uh, so, so how what do you what do you think the joke is there Um, it mostly, I was less concerned with the lyric about the dead don't die than it having more to do with the fact that it is something these people have in common is art, is music. Um, so let me, which I think is sort of, uh, nice. (laughs) Let me like, uh, let let me try to project Mm. what, what I was starting to get from it. Right. It's a critique of materialism. 
And then Jim has this friend, Sturgill Simpson, who wrote this song for him, The Dead Don't Die. And then he's continuously plugging the merchandise mm. of his friend and his film. And then he plugs himself in his film. And then he plugs mm. Adam Driver's film in his film. So even though mm. he's criticizing, the, you know, even, even though the film is criticizing the stuff, it's like, but not for me because I'm good. And here, here's my friend's music. Here's, we're going to talk about me. Bill yeah. Murray is going to reference me as his friend. Um, and then we're going to show my friend Adam Driver's thing. And I then like we're going to, we're going to like have all these different cars and like marketing. And then like one of the like safest spots was the hardware store, which also sells things. Mm-hmm. Like it's just, you know, this, uh, this goofy criticism where like you realize as you criticize that you don't have a leg to stand on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, the, uh, the, uh, the irony is, is there. Yes. For sure. Um, I think that's always kind of what he's been best at is the dead man irony. Yes. Um, uh, did you like most of this cast? No. Not so much? No. Nope. Just not amused? Now, if the question is, do I like these cast members? Yes. If the question is, do I like the this cast in this film? No. But that's more an extension of me not enjoying my experience with the film. Mm-hmm. I think it's a very interesting film now that I'm done. Mm. But it's not a film I want to watch again. Um, mm. Like, for fun. Maybe it's a film I want to watch again for study or intrigue or to, like, make notes and, like, have a further discussion with you or someone else or, or like, really um, try to dig into some of the levels of criticism and, like, philosophy that he's exploring. But it's not something I want to watch for fun. And I think this week what I wanted to do was watch something for fun or let something just kind of take me somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it did for me. I was I was mostly just... You in were in Centerville, Centerville, America. Okay. Yeah, I I uh, was just was just too amused by how not concerned uh, Ronnie and Cliff are, while Mindy's the only one freaking out. Um, uh, I, I I just think they they have um, a rhythm together that's just easy to be around, um, and you know as a uh, you know comment on materialism the running gag being you know all these zombies are wanting to come back to and plugging to do. this material song right and the, i mean even the zombies like it, i think some people have called it very heavy-handed i don't know that i would really agree like i would challenge those people to like so wait what do you think it's a criticism of? i don't know that i would call it a criticism okay um because there's a lot of people they're kind of mothering this movie where they're like hmm. it's about this and it's like well, if the world's going to get destroyed and the moon starts looking funny and nothing's, like, doing what it should, then it might be a commentary on, like, global warming. It might be a commentary on materialism. It might be a commentary on industrialism. Like, there's there's just too many things f- that he's straddling with his metaphors that, yeah, for yeah. us to make a very simple statement. And I think that maybe... It was simple to him, but I think that his art now, you know, speaks in a different way than, you know, whatever restrictions he had on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess I I felt it more just accepting as a fact that global warming is a thing. Not much uh, debate there. And just saying, let's take that as our baseline and just take a look at what these characters might do in this situation. Um, I think this is more about character than it is about um, theme, political theme in a way. I mean, I do think that's inevitably there, but I, 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 to me that's the less satisfying way to experience the film is to think about that instead of um, uh, thinking about how Adam Driver takes three swings to cut off Carol Kane's head. Um, I don't know. Like, I think it's, it's much more concerned with the here and now. That's why there's so little like forward momentum is because he's saying, I shouldn't even say he's saying, but like the world's going to come to an end eventually. Let's at least slow down and kind of enjoy these moments for what we can. And if that means listening to a songs, uh, to a given song a couple more times, that's great. 
That's fine by Especially me. if it's my friend's song. There you go. And I'm selling the uh, the CD at the gas station. Yeah. Did you like the song? I do like the song. It's yeah, a nice song. Me too. Pleasant. It's not a bad. I think I like song. Sturgill Simpson. Just um, as a songwriter. So, yeah. 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 Uh, Selena Gomez, what do you think? Take her, leave her. Replace her with anybody, I think. Really? I kind of liked her, yeah. I was a fan. No, she, she was fine. It's just she wasn't doing anything that Miley Cyrus or, you know, insert a pop star who's now an actor here. Um, mm-hmm. What's the... I'm forgetting her name. She's my um, most squandered actress last year. Oh. Uh, Hudgens? Vanessa, Sorry, Hutchins, Vanessa Hudgens. Right? She would, oh, yeah, she would have been that. fine here. Like, spring, yeah. No, spring it's just kind of this role, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the key to that role is just not like most of these roles is not doing too much. Mm-hmm. He's, he, if anything, I would imagine him saying "do less" uh, well, that's, to that's, any of these actors. Yeah. And I, besides I think, Tilda, exactly. And she's maybe the one I could have just done without. Well, you're um, criticizing the only alien amongst a bunch of humans. So it's true. She gets out of there anyways. Yeah. Spoiler. Uh. Yeah. I'd rewatch it. Mm. Maybe, maybe we will. Are you looking forward to Ghost Dog Two? Yeah, totally. I actually haven't yeah. seen Ghost Dog One, but I, I am just that's ready a good for excuse for us to watch uh, watch the first one. There Get some go. Forrest Whitaker in. There you go. Let's get on to the birds. Puto house macaca purienta ya. Sukata pahi rainta kwai pasu pusu wa sau tuta pusika. De tanto estar con los arijunas, se te olvidaron las costumbres. Pajet ki ma pain. Rafa! The Birds of Passage. All right, you finished Birds of Passage five hours ago? Six hours ago? Not even? This oh, is real no, fresh. I finished it like 11 hours ago. Okay, or okay. Something like that, 11 or 10 hours ago. So you've had all kinds of time to digest it in your sleep. Yes, 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 I have. Where are you at on this one? Hot or cold? Um, it's beautiful. It's it's not hot, but it's warm. It's it's <laughs> it's lower than ninety and higher than seventy six. Okay, okay, that's not bad. I haven't rated it yet, but um, it's a good rate. I think it's I think it's very beautiful to look at. I think it's very beautifully told, um, framed. I I think that. My personal favorite thing is the um, the native chanting that we mm, yeah. um, have accompanied the story throughout, and um, how it it tells the endless story of the time that um, it just speaks of untold wisdom of the people that came before us of how no matter what you know the fine details are on what you're doing with your life the the macro picture of it's always the same. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Um... I thought the 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 cultural uh, context and detail. I mean, that's sort of like the part of the substance here. Is um, is it the way you? Yeah, yeah, I think yes. that's right. Um, uh, just uh, super re- refreshing and and gorgeous, and I, I I just so appreciate the the attention to that uh, detail. Um, I think it's um, a pretty gripping movie without feeling like it's uh, like suspense is its main purpose. Um, like I do feel like there is sort of a sadness waiting on this movie. Mm-hmm. To me, there is definitely like a sense of inevitability to it. Um, to me, that really came through with the score, um, which just has a kind of mournfulness to this. I yes, just don't think there's any um, doubt that this guy is going to. Um, Ultimately, so, have a downfall. At what point were you like, "Whoa, I thought this was a story about a lady." Pretty quickly, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> which I I, I uh, sort of liked the yeah. uh, that little faint. Um, and you've seen? Have you ever seen Narcos? No, I have okay. not seen Narcos. I think it's Narcos Mexico that kind of tells this story. Um, or a, a story very similar to this. Um, it's definitely mm. different setting and location, um, but it's a very, very similar story about mm. families and, you know, this this um, 
shifting from one thing to another thing, shifting from something to marijuana and then from marijuana to coke. Uh, ah, yeah, um, yeah. And and so this never quite gets to coke, if I remember correctly. Um, maybe it does get to coke. Um, yeah, there are some leaps where it clearly looks like their their business is, has grown. Yes. So you don't know if it's just is it, is it just volume or have they yeah switched? Yeah, there's maybe. kind of a yeah, like it doesn't matter. Yeah. That this yeah. for this story, like it it doesn't matter if they switched. What matters is the money it's the and the thriving. story of the yeah. of the family and the tribe and the betrayal. Yeah. It, yeah. It's very much Shakespearean. Definitely. Um, that was something I kept thinking, like Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah, the the five acts. Um, five songs. Five songs, yep. Um, the um, I kind of wanted to go back and, and hear what the guy we hear singing is saying exactly in the very first, like, same as the or end, something. If I remember correctly. Say that one more time. Same as the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just again, placing, um, doubt first and foremost in your mind, um, to not focus you so much on, you know, the possibility of triumph, but more about, you know, the, the incremental decisions and, um, push and pull this guy's feeling and the family's feeling between, uh, tradition and opportunity, I guess. Um, but yeah, I did think about that first scene in, uh, was kind of going back and forth about whether or not, like, it's a little bit of a risk in that I think it's probably going to, like, lead some people astray and be like, why are we not returning to this character as much? But I guess my only thought was that, like, what we're, what we're learning about there is kind of like the severity of the tradition. Um, yes. Like, I think she's, I think she said she, she had been confined. We don't know exactly what that means for, like, a year. Mm-hmm. Um so it kind of does this job of well, like we not... kind of find out when they put uh, Leonidas in the confinement, right? So I think it means like he she's literally been in there yes for a year like that's pretty severe. So if you didn't have that, I think you might risk sort of like this romanticized view of the tradition, yes. and I think that does certainly suggest like um, you know that there are kind of cost to tradition in a way that's maybe not the right word but um but it there, avoids there's also maybe romanticizing it there is maybe a good evolutionary reasons to do it right mm. like just if you're trying to make a creature that survives to remove them from the world so they don't get caught up in something for a year so literally just, protect them yeah well not only you're protecting them but you're separating them from creating a separate life mm. um so boom you have them they're confined, and then you can sell them, which brings your family, or, you know, it's a dowry, but it's basically selling. You're selling them to the best family you can find for a dowry that makes your family rich and allows that girl to then make her whole life, whoever she's marrying. Yeah. Which yeah. I think isn't the worst evolutionary trait. You know, like, it, it sounds pretty effective to me. Yeah. Like, maybe morally, I find it repugnant now. But back then, like, it might have been very, very useful for your family to survive yeah. for generations on the desert. Yeah, it was rooted in something rational. Yes. Or, yeah, well, something evolutionarily useful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we kind of see this story show evolution, you know, through this industrialization of the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where we're taking these axes that we use to chop trees and chopping planes apart and burying them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I really liked, uh, the whole cast. I was just kind of quickly flipping through some of the people and it looked like most of them had no credit. So they kind of uh, seemed to be all non-professionals. Yeah. Kind of an apocalypto um, scenario. Oh, is that just, right? Same deal there. Well, yeah. They just go get like these real people and then yeah. ask them to do these things, just tasks and then shoot yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I, like that's definitely where some of the authenticity comes from. I think like, Mel Gibson he, says that the thing that he kept telling them was like, act confident, just act confident, uh, no matter what you're doing, just act confident. Just fake it till you make it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great advice. It works for Apocalypto. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. It was when we did first impressions for Birds of Passage, which I think was maybe quite a while ago. Um, you get some of those clips of um, people with like their masks or uh scars over their faces 
and you and you said that it looked sort of surreal to you. Yes. And I think I resisted that. I was like, I don't know, this is really surrealism. But you were totally right because there literally are dream sequences here, right? That are quite surreal. Or like that um, house just in the middle of the desert. Yeah, yeah. I just kind of assumed that those were like. Um, I don't know, grounded in tradition, but there literally are some, like, surreal um, dream sequences here. I think we're we're really nicely uh, put together. Tied in with that omen feeling. Um, Yeah. What is it? She sees the grasshopper and then says, um, a plague is coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Love the shot towards the end of the, um, what is it, the, you know, the insects kind of swarming into that cloud. That was a great Mm -hmm. shot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of a nice uh, sort of visual um, touches here. I mean, partly just from, like, some of the wardrobes, too, um, uh, which I think, I don't know, it's just all that cultural detail. It's very, yeah. very refreshing. Um, so did this did this meet your expectations, or? Uh, yeah, I think it kind of hit it right on the mark. Um, what Is about it... you? I don't know yet. I don't mm. know. It definitely exceeded my floor Mm. i i think i might have been hoping for something even stronger Mm. just because it kind of did have a a bunch of positive noise about it i think being made in february yeah Um, so i thought maybe it was going to be a little bit more punchy Mm. um at some points and i don't know that i fully felt so much as just recognize shakespearean trope some Mm. of this stuff like some of it just kind of felt like it was mapping on to other storytelling yeah like other stories like i was i was feeling other stories inside this story Mm. um kind of like the wild pear tree Um, Mm. yeah yeah um yeah yeah i could see that i mean i think sometimes this turns to cliches to kind of get the mirrors or get the gears moving um you have the first kind of hot-headed guy who kills two people in front of the planes i think that character gets forgiven then gets killed then you have the son who you're slowly seeing grow up or the cousin um eventually make the terrible choice that costs the family everything um and they should have just handled him to begin with like it's not that those are tropes but those are i i think those are just truths and i i just i i don't know that it's great so much is very good yeah yeah i mean there there was nothing that was like difficult to believe about those characters but it also didn't really make this story um that much more interesting by having those be the kinds of characters that create conflict yes um those are very familiar types who cause trouble um believably so in this case but it's also not as new as you know a lot of this kind of cultural detail is um but uh do regret not seeing it in the theater just because i do think it is um would have been a little bit stronger yeah yeah uh, especially with just kind of how vast that landscape is like i think especially on a wide screen that would look really good um, that's true of arctic like, that's true absolutely very much um it might have just overwhelmed me a little bit more um but uh still held up on the small screen as well yeah and did you watch this on the phone uh, half, one quarter on phone, three quarters TV. Okay. Last night. Still worked on the phone. That was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, very rich, um, cinematography on the phone. Um, it's almost easier when it's smaller to, to see the setup and the, mm. the framing and, and what, how they're composing the shots. Yeah. I think I when it's bigger, it. it's very hard to get the, uh, the circumference perspective. Or the perimeter yeah, perspective or of the uh, yeah. of the picture. Yeah, definitely, I can see that. Yeah, unsure about the rating, but would you recommend it? Absolutely, hundred um, percent. Is it in your top ten? Um, I don't think so. It's close though. Is it uh, in your top ten foreign films? Yeah, definitely. Okay. You? Yep. Yep. I think it's probably around. It's probably going to be in the, what would that be, low 20s or high hmm. teens for me. And it's gotcha. probably in my top 10 foreign, foreign films. Or you mean, oh, got it, got it. Yeah. Haven't, yeah. I think I'm probably only in like 13 foreign films yeah. this year. 
I keep kind of making my list and then scrapping it and starting over. So yeah. I need to <laughs> revisit. Need to stick to it. Yeah. All right. Well, that is Birds of Passage. On to all that jazz. Well, I do jazz hands. Yo, you love show business. That's right. I love show business. All that love. I'll go either way. It's showtime, folks. All that jazz. Our bossy thon continues. And ends. With all that jazz. How high were your hopes for this one? Was this uh, one you were particularly stoked for? I didn't even have high hopes. I was just confident that I would enjoy it, and I did. There you go. Um, So we've watched Cabaret, Lenny. Um, Do you have an an easy favorite of these three so far? I was expecting all that jazz to be my favorite. Um, There are three very different films. Yeah. I think All That Jazz is my personal favorite film as a person Mm. of Bob Fosse's work. Um, And then it gets very, very subjective if we're talking about, um, like, filmmaking nuances and stuff. But, like, if we're just going, like, Taylor's favorite, All That Jazz. There you go. But there's... I can make a case for Lenny. I can make a case for Cabaret. I could, too. I mean, I... I think I like the numbers here the best. I like the dancing here the best. I the love editing? Lyzerman. Jesus Christ, the editing. I, but I, I really like the editing in Lenny. I love the black and white in yeah. Lenny. I love. I like Dustin Hoffman there. I, you know, I, these are all pretty darn close. Like, there are but things the, about each of these that I really like. The snap, like. snap, snap editing Ooh, yeah. during that musical number kind of in the middle of this film. Oh, yeah. Where, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's just something. I'm, or like the casting, oh man, just the the opening musical number. There's there's this middle number where it just cuts, 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 and it's like these master cuts, of, and it's like making shapes, and almost like it's like a dance that spells out a feeling or something. The way that it's cut, like it's and it oh, yeah. just kind of goes straight back. It's like a straight back cut. It's hard to explain, but it's yeah. so so good. I did really like the touch and all that jazz where he's listening to the critic on tv talk about his editing of lenny or what we yeah. kind of know is lenny and she's saying you know he cuts off before any of the drama oh. can complete itself and it's like yeah it's perfect <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like out of my four balloon system i give it half a balloon <laughs> yeah i'm always like i can't say that i've found that many movies that um, sort of poke fun at critics in a way that I really like. That was a nice little bar. Yes, yes, it was. Um, because especially I, <laughs> because we see him earlier uh, reading all the good reviews and yeah. loving it. Yeah. So he's yeah. like, I only want the good ones. You, you know, there's yeah. something um, human about that. Definitely. Very human about Bob. Yeah. Uh, I'm forgetting this actor's name. It took me forever to realize this was the guy from Jaws. I was like, why do I know this guy? And the guy? guy from Sorcerer. I have not seen Sorcerer. That's freaking right. Yeah. Yeah. Haven't seen that one. Um, what do you think of him? Very good. Very, Did very you? good. Yes. I was a little cooler on him. It's uh, Roy Scheider. Right? Yeah. 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 That sounds right. Yeah. He's very good. I like uh, yeah. him a lot. I liked him. I, I was maybe cooler on him than I had hoped to be. Um, but he got the job done for me. Yeah. Um, and did the show enhance your viewing oh 100 percent. i would think so yeah i got all the little nuances (laughs) and the subtexts and i know like some of the backstory of like what this shot means Mm, yeah because yeah there's there's definitely some depth and nuance to the emotions of these characters in the film right like we do see gwen verdon played by a different actress in this and then we see his daughter played by a different actress than his daughter and in the show we see him ask his daughter if she wants to play herself in the film she oh. says yes and then the next thing we see is that his daughter is crying and someone else is playing her Ooh. so it's just like you know it's that continuous thing where he's just always a disappointment right it's that yeah. um he opens the door and says god i'm a terrible father and then it cuts to the next scene and it's when yeah. the, while the door is open. And it's like that door is always open for him to be a better dad. And he keeps opening the door to be a bad father. Yeah. So, yeah, it sounds like the show 
is maybe not uh it informs the tapestry of yeah. all that jazz all that jazz is definitely tapestral like it it is all of bob's nuances in life and gwen's nuances and, and her personality and yeah and wrinklings and having the background of all of those is very very helpful yeah so it sounds like the show isn't terribly sympathetic maybe not um attacking him but it but it's at least honest about like whatever sort of like damage he did yes it's definitely self-critical and i think it's mostly based on gwen verdon's book Ah, so it definitely is a is a half split and i mean bob's just he's not the most sympathetic character like you just watched a film about him where he didn't make himself very sympathetic right well that's exactly what i was about to ask was like i think yeah it's 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 an interesting movie because like I think it is this it's obviously this work of self reflection. Um, he doesn't make himself out to be that sympathetic. Like I think not knowing his background, just knowing that this is supposedly autobiographical, it, he's clearly honest about his womanizing. Um, but honest at the same... about where it starts in the um, burlesque show, right? When he right. was a teenage boy and he had intercourse with like three women at once to lose his virginity oh i did not know that so they show that and they were all uh, older women well it was yeah. implied when um, yeah. in that musical number where the three girls come up to him and then he goes out on stage dances and then it, they all start laughing pants down to his pants and he's yeah. got cream in his jeans yeah yeah i uh was was very intrigued by like his sort of like look at his own um look at the, like his uh, the roots of his own sort of destructive behavior um it's sort of like where the ego does kind of come back in and he and you feel him sort of saying he's like but i'm pretty good right i i feel that a little bit and like that's just never been like my favorite tendency and something that's a little autobiographical but he is pretty Pretty good good. (laughs) (laughs) so that's why it's tough yeah (laughs) um so yeah that's like i i I, I, it's it's just a weird movie to to really in like to really enjoy it to kind of still feel bad about like um, I don't think you have to like Bob to appreciate Bob. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think that might help you um, unlock <laughs> you know, a way of of loving his art and maybe questioning the morals of the man. And then yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, well, if you agree you love his art, then maybe maybe his compromised morals were worth it. Right. Or, or maybe that's a that's a conversation we need to consider having. You know? Right. And in something like Cabaret, like it's very easy to, to say, like, director Bob Fosse might have been a womanizer, whatever, like I can put that aside and enjoy Cabaret. All that jazz is like putting all that up front and center. Yes. So it's like you're at the same time making sense of whether or not he is um admitting to it or being like a little like defensive about it i don't know that i've really come down on it one way or the other um but uh something that i just keep thinking about as i mostly enjoyed what was on screen it's interesting that like we point that out and we're not like critical of you know or like when we talk about orson welles we're not like well this guy fucked over his friends and was a mooch and an alcoholic and you know a glutton like you know, we're we're just criticizing Fosse for like this one very um, specific vice. You know, and yeah, we do yeah. see his addiction to dexedrine and and all that yep. stuff, but we're not talking about that. You know, we're talking about the womanizing, and it's like, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. The, the you know, how much do you blame each party in that relationship? Because mm. it's like it just keeps happening, and the women <laughs> are throwing themselves at Bobby at some points. You know, you know. And and so it's like, it's just a complex character more than anything. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's good. He is good. He does know what he's doing. Um, I I think I like. I think I enjoyed every single number. Um, oh, I love these numbers. Right. I mean, they're they're, they're so. Uh, oof. They're just <laughs> they're glistening. Do you have a favorite? They shine. The opening one where it's like the whole. It's everyone that he's going to um, pull his cast from, I think. Right? Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's huge a huge opening number. On stage. Yeah, I was like, huge. oh my gosh, this is incredible. <laughs> and like nothing nothing ever topped that for me. That was just so. 
amazing. Like, I love all the other stuff, too, but that was just... Yeah, I think it kind of zooms out and, mm-hmm. like... You and you're like, the what stage, the hell? Like, there's a lot of people up there. <laughs> yeah, there's some crazy shots where they like just keep pulling out, pulling out, pulling. And you're like, how did you get that good of a shot that close if you're this far away now? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of wish I had paid more attention to who. It... Did they talk about his cinematographers at all in the show by, by chance? I don't think so, no. No, it's know. very I would egocentric still attribute, towards like, Bob. placement and that kind of thing to him, but like I do think he has an eye for like usually where to put the camera. And, and, and varies it in like very refreshing ways um, one uh one fun anecdote from the show is um well I, I think it's gwen says and i'm sure it's not really accurate but gwen says something snarky like and i'm sure you'll get an actor to play you that has a fuller head of hair and mm. bobby like rubs his balding head you you know uh sam rubs his balding head and then he goes probably <laughs> and then you see uh you, you see shoot what's his name um Roy, Roy Scheider and there with the toupee on the center uh, yeah. and and like it's just it's so ironic to know like that he could have had himself look a little bit more like himself and that he opted to put the toupee on Scheider that's a nice touch and it, it's uh yeah I, you almost wonder if he did it on purpose as like a commentary on himself yeah in some yeah. way or if it was just you know <laughs> ego it's a nice touch uh yeah, I think my favorite would have been the his daughter and girlfriend, their duet in his living room. It was adorable. Um, but I also love the shot in that final number when everyone's lighting up their candles, kind mm-hmm. of in the like stands around him. Oh, those are nice shots. That's uh, hands. yeah, that's in the show. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> like this, the the setup of that. That's what you're seeing them. You you, you see it get filmed. In oh the show. yeah. Uh, yeah. Lynn Manuel it's Miranda a... plays uh, Roy Scheider. Oh, nice. That's that's inspired cast. Anything else? Who was your favorite performer in the film? My favorite performer. Um, you go well, I think. Oh boy, stabbing me. It was whoever played Gwen Verdon. I haven't had time to mm. look up the cast, but whoever played Gwen, um, the way that it was, she she played age gracefully. You know, when she gets hurt and then keeps dancing when he walks in. Oh, yeah. Um, when he's taking that break. Um, and, and the way that she, like, dances towards him. It, when she's just doing... Imp- she's ostensibly doing improvisation that whole time. And there's just this... Uh, there's this sultry seductiveness to her style that is also professional. That exactly mm-hmm. mirrors kind of the Gwen we see in the show. Oh, and yeah. just... Yeah, it might just be a projection of how much I love Michelle Williams, and then seeing someone also do that good, like it's just <laughs> the liking yes. carries over. Yeah, for some yeah. reason, I I just like that. Um, I, I like Gwen right now. Yeah, I really do. Yeah, I wish I knew the actress's name, but um, whoever plays his ex-wife, I did like quite a bit. I don't know that I've totally figured that character out. That's but Gwen. She... Is his ex-wife? Oh, I thought. Uh... That is Gwen? That's Gwen Verdon? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. I was confused. I Anne thought... Rankling's the taller one, played by Margaret, Margaret Qualley in the television show. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Okay, so I've mixed up my people a little bit, but then I guess we're talking about the same person. Yes. Um, yeah, 100%. Um, I, yeah, you I, just I keep think... seeing her work. Yeah. Keep seeing her parent. Like, she just keeps doing, you know? Like, she's the yeah. reason why Bob made what he made. Yeah. Yeah, I... I yeah i don't know that was that was just a clear miss on my part i thought there was some other recurring character who i thought i'd already identified as verdon um but yeah yeah uh, yeah i thought she was great i mean um she uh sort of stands in as like the your as the person like expressing the kind of exasperation you feel with him like i can kind of i identify her when she's sort of um very uh, just frustrated Yes. Um, it's it's well to the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get that's kind of the point. Yes. <laughs> that womanizing idiot genius. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's the like th- there's some line where she's very upset and I don't know if she says like I forget what it is her first line is but she says but damn it is it good Bob and then she kind of front out of the room. Yeah. Um, 
And it's like, you, you agree with her. But it, this is a movie by Fosse about Fosse. So is like, do you really appreciate him making that comment about himself? Well, it is um, autobiographical. And yeah. in the, you would assume in the book she said that because in the show based off her book, she says things like that all the time. Yeah. Even though yeah. she's always fed up with him and, and hates him. Like she, that's the director she wants for her Chicago, yeah. right? Which is the, they still use her steps today in Chicago um mm. or you know her routine and choreography so i i think it is a sincere statement from bob i do sincere me, like he sincerely thinks that she's fed up with him but also that she loves it like she right. loves his work which it's like or working if, with him i don't know like that, that like that i get that much satisfaction out of an an artist recognizing that somebody else really loves his work well, that I, kind of makes sense? I, I think yes i see what you're saying but i i think that uh, i think his only equal is gwen so i think mm. that 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 statement has a different calibration than like people looking up to him that's like his equal saying mm. that he did good mm. yeah yeah uh the person whose criticism he actually listens to yeah where we the most yes yeah yeah that's fair um so when you look at roy are you always seeing bob fossey no i see lynn manuel miranda oh there you go (laughs) (laughs) i was gonna say it's gotta be getting a little confusing (laughs) no it's you definitely see a uh an ego representation of bob of, of like what he wishes he was or how he wishes he was or yeah you know that type of thing yeah, yeah. So it is right, and and that's um, that's described by that uh, that gal who says, "Do you think I could be a movie star? 40, 40 feet wide on on the on the screen." Oh yeah. And he yeah. says, "No, but I can, you know, I can, I can make you better." Yes. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think that that's also commentary, and like he knows that even though he could do it, he's not right for it. Yeah, yeah. She was she was great too. Um, uh, she was like the person who I felt most wanted to um, kind of do something with her role in this show. That was maybe one thing that held me back a little bit was that I in don't the show know. or the film in the show. Like she wants to be the best dancer she can be. Oh, in and the show, in the film. Correct. Okay, not yeah. in the television <laughs> show. Correct. Right. The yes, yes. Um, her 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 passion, her commitment, her um desperately wanting to succeed was very clear um i think i maybe didn't get quite as much of that from joe gideon as i would have liked about just like how much this show meant to him um but it sort of was fine because he's putting it on and it's great so well, i think you i i think um you see how much it means to them or to him as a consequence of the you know what it does to him health wise right right i think that um, kind of speaks for itself and also speaks for his inability to like express his emotions correctly well yeah i mean i i mean you're right i mean i get that through the um you know repetition of his routine the emphasis on his sort of fanaticism and obsession as an actor i don't know that i ever really felt like i was seeing roy convince me that as joe gideon this guy is dying to put on this show Hmm. um he is literally dying and i and that is i I think very effectively communicated with the editing and with the repetition um just as a work of like of as a character i'm not sure that was ever quite as like fully enthusiastic yeah yeah yeah. but i don't know i think i i think i probably have to just like be open to the fact that it's maybe more that it just just wasn't what i was expecting rather than like that really being a criticism Mm. like i kind of thought that this was going to be about them putting on the show and it being a big success i had like no idea that this was about him like literally killing himself and ended up in the hospital 
Um, so I almost just kind of need to like recalibrate. And, yeah. And probably we'll get higher with it next time. Yeah, it's it's the it's the consequence of creating the art. And I I mean, is he enthusiastic to make it? Maybe not. Is he dying to make it? It sure seems that way. <laughs> it seems to be the case. <laughs> it seems like that's. It seems like he wants to make it, and he's willing to die to do it. So um, maybe that's, that's not true. the it way that, that you that. prefer to look at dying <laughs> to do it. But that is the yeah. outcome. Yeah, yeah. I did like. I think it's when, uh, like, the producers are talking about, um, you know, taking out the insurance claim against him, or maybe they're just talking about killing the show outright. I forget what their meeting oh, is about. Beautiful shot with the table reflection. Oh, everybody yeah. Everybody in the window in the middle. Yeah. And they're cutting back. I think in that scene to his surgery mm-hmm. and him literally getting ripped open. Yep. It's like you want to hear him just scream, "You're tearing me apart." <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, <laughs> yeah. uh, just uh, you know, that's the edit, same kind of editing that you know we already saw on Lenny. Yep, just as effective, um, satisfying stuff. Beautiful. I'm glad we did it. Word. Fosse complete. Run! Go! Get to the chopper! We have to go. I'm coming with you. That was brilliant. Another one in the can.